Whenever you watch a UFC pay-per-view, you'll see the program kicked off with the commentators, briefly explaining what the judges will be looking for when determining the winner of each fight that isn't stopped by a referee. And scoring is based on effective striking and grappling, followed by aggression, and then octagon control in that order. This explanation is about as summarized as you can get the actual scoring system, written in the unified rules of MMA, and can be pretty vague to anyone who hasn't been watching the sport for too long. It's not hard to determine what effective striking is, but what is considered effective grappling? And what exactly is octagon control? More importantly, which aspect of the fight is scored more than the rest? Well, if you would have asked me back in 2009, when I really began watching the sport religiously, without looking at the actual scoring system, I would have begrudgingly told you that all you have to do to win fights in MMA, or at least just in the UFC, is take your opponent to the ground and hold position while only being active enough to keep the ref from standing you back up. And if you can take your opponent down, just be sure to bite down on your mouthpiece and keep pressing forward no matter how many times your opponent is hitting you. Don't back up. This is octagon control, and this is what the judges want to see. If you have strong wrestling skills and a solid chin, you're gonna make it. Now of course I'm being facetious. Anyone familiar with this era of the sport, all of the champions that it produced, knows that you couldn't just stall your way to the top, or just give up enough brain cells to get you to a championship. But for most of us fans at the time, nothing was more frustrating than watching a fighter give his all in the octagon and put the heat on his opponent for the majority of a fight, only to get taken down and held at the last minute of each round, and ultimately lose by decision. To me, it was even more frustrating watching an evasive, technical wizard put on a counter-striking clinic against their opponent, only to get their elusiveness penalized by the judges, and lose because the other guy was more aggressive. If this is really what the judging criteria prioritized, and officials were actually judging fights according to the rules, then changes needed to be made, because this led to some very cheap and unsatisfying outcomes, as well as some awfully slow-paced and boring fights. Fortunately, the athletic commissions and fighters would work together in 2016 to revamp the unified rules of MMA with a new scoring system much more focused on the actual impact of a fighter's actions in each striking and grappling exchange rather than how active a fighter is in them, or as Big John McCarthy put it. Who is doing the most to impact the fight and to bring a fight to the end? That's what we're looking for. While it took some time for the judges to adjust after these changes took effect in 2017, we gradually began to see the results. Fights that had me rolling my eyes thinking that I was going to see another oversized wrestler win a decision by using ground control with no meaningful offense were surprisingly called for the other fighter. And fighters who would walk their opponents down near the end of a fight, making gestures and getting the drunken audience riled up, wouldn't be able to sway the judging their way with their meaningless aggression any longer. However, despite the progress the sport has made because of these changes, we can always count on human error, incompetence, or downright corruption if you're a conspiracy theorist to rear its ugly head and give us some bad calls, leaving us wondering what we just looked at. And because the commentators tend to completely disregard the rules at times due to their own biases, as well as fans on social media who probably never even bothered to take a look at them, it's easy for the casual audience and new fans to be misguided as to what actually matters in an MMA fight. Two of the most recent fight outcomes that really stirred the pot and got fans arguing over how fights are scored, or at least how they should be scored, were TJ Dillashaw's title eliminator win over Corey Sanhagen, and of course, Francis Ngannou's heavyweight title defense over Surreal Ghan. Two fights that saw both winners outstruck by their opponents on the feet, but seem to have gotten a nod due to their duration of ground control. Scrolling through some of the fan arguments on YouTube in the aftermath of these fights, I noticed that the subject of octagon control and its importance in a fight was making its return. Only this time, fans have coined their own term in its place. Control time. Fighter A didn't do enough damage in the stand-up or on the ground to negate Fighter B's control time. Fighter A may have doubled the amount of strikes than Fighter B did, but because Fighter B had 3 minutes of control time in a 5 minute round, he wins the round. While I don't want to spend my time trying to break down the entire scoring system in the new unified rules, I do want to go over some of its major points that I think dispels the theory of control time and what fans and some commentators seem to believe its importance is in MMA. Now, when you actually take a look at the criteria and read what it considers effective grappling, you'll learn a hard truth about what these fans call control time. It doesn't matter! While the term control time isn't actually listed as a judging criteria, what we do have are the terms cage slash ring control and fighting area control. And according to the rules, this criteria takes the lowest priority in judging, as stated. Effective striking slash grappling shall be considered the first priority of round assessments. Effective aggressiveness is plan B, and should not be considered unless the judge does not see any advantage in the effective striking slash grappling realm. Cage slash ring control, plan C, should only be needed when all other criteria are 100% even for both competitors. This will be an extremely rare occurrence. Now here's where fans of both sides of the argument are going to start butting heads. The rules clearly state that effective striking and grappling are prioritized over cage slash ring control, or as the rules will later call it, fighting area control. But what exactly is the act of holding position on an opponent? 
Fans who use the term control time and claim that it's scored equally with both striking and submission attempts may have made up that term because they're not actually familiar with the scoring system. But listening to some of their arguments, I'd say that it's safe to assume that a lot of them are conflating control time with effective grappling. So who's right and wrong here? And how do the rules distinguish between effective grappling and fighting area control? How do the rules even define fighting area control? Fighting area control is assessed by determining who is dictating the pace, place, and position of the match. Fighting area control shall only be assessed if effective striking slash grappling and effective aggressiveness is 100% equal for both competitors. This will be assessed very rarely. Now I already know what some of you are thinking. This here is only talking about placement and positioning. Takedowns and ground control is effective grappling. Well here's what the rules define as effective grappling. Successful execution of takedowns, submission attempts, reversals, and the achievement of advantageous positions that produce immediate or cumulative impact with the potential to contribute to the end of the match, with the immediate weighing more heavily than the cumulative impact. I want you to pay close attention to that last part, that produce immediate or cumulative impact with potential to end the fight, with the immediate weighing more heavily than the cumulative. Now interpret that as you will, but the way I see it, holding position and riding the clock whether it be on the ground or against the fence, it's not going to bring the fight any closer to ending. Plenty of fans have made the argument that holding a fighter in position and making him carry a weight as well as making it harder for him to breathe is essentially bringing the fight closer to an end by tiring them out. Now while I don't disagree with this point completely, I would argue that working to deplete your opponent's gas tank would fall under cumulative impact because unless your opponent is in complete couch potato shape or has an asthma attack in the middle of the fight, you're not going to stop him by simply putting weight on him especially not in any matter that would be considered immediate. Immediate impact in a grappling exchange would be ground and pound from top position, elbows that lead to cuts or heavy upkicks from bottom position, heavy strikes from the clinch, and of course, submission attempts, whether from top position, bottom position, or out of nowhere. At least that's how I see it. Now there's also the argument out there that failed submission attempts are mostly ineffective, as most of them don't even hurt the opponent unless the fighter taps. Well, this isn't a video game we're watching here, and these fighters don't have health and stamina bars showing us what kind of damage they're taking in real time, so there's no real way for us to gauge what a submission attempt is actually doing to them other than by superficial means. But I will argue that choking your opponent or torquing on one of their limbs for a good duration of a grappling exchange is doing far more to bring the fight closer to an immediate end than laying on them and holding position. Now I know what else you may be thinking. Take down score points. If fighter A is outstriking fighter B, if fighter B scores multiple takedowns, he wins the round. Well, here's what the rules specifically say about takedowns. It shall be noted that a takedown is not merely a changing of position, but the establishment of an attack from the use of the takedown. Top and bottom position fighters are assessed more on the impactful slash effective result of their actions, more so than their position. Notice that it says the establishment of an attack and not the establishment of control. As far as I see it, the rules make it clear that more needs to be done than simply getting your opponent to the ground to be awarded a successful takedown. So no matter what DC tells you about how takedowns are scored in wrestling, according to the unified rules of MMA, simply getting your opponents to the ground means nothing if not followed by any kind of meaningful offense. That being said, yes, slamming your opponent on the canvas should be considered an established attack, as it does indeed have immediate impact in bringing the fight closer to ending. So at this point, if the rules say that a successful takedown is not merely a changing of position, but the establishment of an attack from the use of the takedown, Perhaps it's safe to say that a takedown without the establishment of an attack is merely a changing of position and would fall under fighting area control, which again is only scored when the effect of striking and grappling is 100% equal between both fighters. So when fighter B takes fighter A down and controls him for 3 minutes but doesn't make enough impact to negate fighter A outstriking him in the previous 2 minutes, his control time ultimately accounts for nothing. Your made... wrestling is zero, your grappling is zero. Stop. Now, one thing you have to remember is that these officials are judging these rounds from cage side as they happen, with no access to real-time fight metrics. So in a fast-paced, razor-close fight, where it's hard to tell which fighter is landing more and which strikes are having a bigger impact, or in a slow-paced fight, where both fighters are tentative on the feet and throwing light shots at each other with no real intent to cause impact, we really shouldn't be too up in arms when a fighter is given the nod by getting some control time in, regardless of what the fight metrics say afterward. It is what it is. But in the vast majority of these fights, as stated by the scoring system itself, assessing control should be a rare occurrence. Effective striking and grappling trumps all. Now you may have noticed that cage slash ring control was considered plan C as criteria for judges to use when assessing these fights. So what does that mean about plan B, effective aggressiveness? How do the rules define effective aggressiveness? 
aggressively making attempts to finish the fight. The key term is effective. Chasing after an opponent with no effective result or impact should not render the judge's assessment. Effective aggressiveness is only to be assessed if effective striking slash grappling is 100% equal for both competitors. Now the way that was written makes it sound specific to the stand-up aspect of a fight when they talk about chasing after an opponent. And I think it's safe to assume that this was added to make sure that fighters with an evasive yet effective style were having their actions assessed as they should be. But what about in the grappling exchange? Is aggression even to be assessed when a fight goes to the ground? Well, since the rules don't elaborate on the matter, that leaves us to make assumptions. And if you take what they consider effective grappling and combine that with what they define as effective aggressiveness, aggressively making attempts to finish the fight, I personally wouldn't consider a holding position on the ground or against the fence effective aggressiveness over something like ground and pound, submission attempts, or even heavy strikes from bottom position. One could argue that transitioning to better your position when on top is essentially making attempts to end the fight, but we have to remember everything written prior in the rule set. Immediate impact holds more weight in a judge's assessment than cumulative impact. And also, aggression is considered plan B criteria and is only to be scored when effective striking and grappling are equal. So when fighter A gets deep into a submission attempt and fighter B survives but can only counter with positional transitions or holding top position, any perceived aggression from fighter B should account for nothing. You get nothing! You lose! Good day, sir! Looking at the scoring system overall, it really seems to be written in a way to avoid stalling being rewarded in a fight and to keep judges from putting too much consideration into superficial aspects of a fight like aggression. If you feel that control time shouldn't be disregarded this much in a fight, and judges should assess it equally with striking and grappling, that's a whole nother argument for a different day. But I honestly don't think that it would be as big of an issue amongst fans if the refs did a slightly better job of knowing when to break clinches and stand fighters back up. I understand that grappling is physically taxing, and time needs to be given for fighters to transition and get themselves in a position where they can actually be effective. I understand that takedowns can be physically taxing as well, and aren't always easy to achieve. But when a stalemate occurs and both fighters are stuck in one position only throwing light and effective strikes at each other, it's time to stand them back up in my opinion, especially if neither fighter is showing any effort to better their position. Now overall, this is just my interpretation of the scoring system. I wasn't there at the board meeting when these rules were written, nor did I ever speak to any officials personally about how they intended fights to be judged. I'm only basing my analysis on what the rules specifically say and what I've read in interviews about how the officials intended them to be utilized. While I thank the MMA gods and their profits every night for bringing us this new scoring system and getting us out of the lay and pray era of the sport, I think the judging criteria overall is still open for criticism, especially when you get into what the rules deem as impact, or as fans call it, damage. I'm not saying that these rules are perfect, I just don't want to see the sport begin to regress because of fans, commentators, and officials disregarding what the rules actually are.